It's April 30th, 1952, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. With his bulbous nose, sticky out ears, and slightly nervous smile, Mr. Potato Head makes for an unexpected-looking business trailblazer. And yet, the advertising industry owes an enormous debt to him because it was today in history in 1952 that Mr. Potato Head starred in the first ever nationally televised ad campaign for a toy, unleashing the demon force of kitty pester power on an unsuspecting world. And I think at this point we have to uh, scratch the image of Mr. Potato Head that you have in your head right now. Now, because Mr. Potato Head then in 1952, mm. surreal, <laughs> I had no idea, was a box of like costume <laughs> jewellery to be appended to a real potato. <laughs> Mr. Potato Head does not include potato. <laughs> no, yeah. so, so it seems obvious when you know, yeah. but the original idea of Mr. Potato Head was like, here are some things to pin in some fruit and turn it into a funny face. And that's what you got. There was no plastic potato. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you were enamoured with the advert you saw on this day and you decided to buy one, what you would be getting was a plastic body. This is the other thing. It had a body. It wasn't just a head with feet on the bottom. A plastic body with an incredibly sharp spike on top, like the kind that German soldiers had in World War One on their helmets, like an impaling spike that would never be done now. And then just a bunch of face parts, like lips and glasses, just add your own potato. Although... The face parts were sort of modelled or displayed on a sort of styrofoam stand-in mm. heads. Like, if you really couldn't face could wasting a veggie, yeah. Before doing it on something else. You organic. had your styrofoam. <laughs> and each of those head pieces also had their own stabby little daggers because, you know, you You're just did buying have to, a box of daggers. <laughs> yeah, you had to push them into a potato, which is not a thing that necessarily wants to have stuff pushed into it. So, yeah, it really was a very different thing to the toy that we know today. But this was also a really good choice of first toy to demonstrate in an ad because, yes, you're demonstrating something that really benefits from demonstration. It's a creative act. You want to get creative once you've seen what you can do with the potato. You want to get your own potato and do the same thing. Also, it doesn't require what later toys from the likes of Mattel required, uh, which was brand building. You know, Barbie and G.I. Joe. Mm. You only want to own those things once you understand the entire universe of those characters and you want to aspire to be them. No Mm. one was aspiring to be the funny potato. It was just, (laughs) here's a, hey kids, here's a thing you can do at home right now. Wouldn't you like to do it? Yes, that's fun. Looking back to the history of Mr. Potato Head. It was the invention of George Lerner in 1949, and he took inspiration from his own childhood, and he was making dolls from potatoes with his younger sisters. He called this whole concept make a face, and you could do it with anything. He actually Mm. used other fruits as the face parts too, like he would attach grapes to a beet using cocktail sticks. Again, stabby things were a part of it. You could put it just in your friend's face to make an extra face on their face. (laughs) And even in the beginning, when you look at the packaging of the original Mr. Potato Head, despite the name, there are demonstrations on the box of other fun yes. fruits and vegetables with which you might use the, these facial parts. Yes, yeah. a cucumber, a pear and a pepper. Well, at the very beginning, he had trouble getting anyone interested in the whole concept. The main concern among toy manufacturers was that people were worried that immediately in the wake of kind of the food rationing of World War II, Americans would have thought that this seemed like a very wasteful mm. thing to do, to allow their children to be playing with fruit and vegetables in the first place. But the one company that did pick up the idea was a food company that agreed to pay a small licensing fee to basically distribute his packets of facial pieces as a prize inside their cereal boxes. But he still wanted them to be a standalone toy uh, learner, and so he continued to approach uh, various uh, toy manufacturers directly, and eventually he found Henry and Merrill Hassenfield, these two brothers, who Hass brothers, Hasbro, uh, that's where their uh, company name came from, and they agreed to pay not only $2,000 to the cereal company to stop their production of these facial pieces, but they also bought the rights to the toy itself from Lerner for 5000 But he got an advance of $500 and then had 5% royalties for every set sold. So this was a good piece of business for him. 
And it was a bit of a gamble for Hasbro as well. You know, they'd started life as a textile company in 1923 and they were making pencil cases. And then they started making school supplies, uh, fancy dress kits for kids made of textiles until eventually by the 1940s, they had become a toy manufacturer, albeit not a large one. Mr. Potato Head would be the making of Hasbro. But I think their inexperience in the toy market does explain how this was advertised outside of television, which is in a catalogue. So all of their products were in the catalogue, some for grown-ups, some for offices, you know, some for kids. And so the description for Mr Potato Head in the Hasbro catalogue from 1952 reads, the most ideal item for gift, party favour, or the young invalid, which seems really (laughs) weird to me. (laughs) I suppose speaks to how rare it was to buy your child a toy, a mass-produced toy. It was just like, well, if they can't move, I'll buy them something. (laughs) (laughs) It's fascinating, too, how they innovated from Mr. Potato Head in 52 to Mrs. Potato Head in 53. And eventually they came up with children for the family named Spud and Yam. I'm surprised in this world of brand extensions and universes that Spud and Yam have been lost to history, actually. That is weird, (laughs) yeah. But But then they came up with these friends of the Potato Head family, which were Cookie Cucumber, Pete the Pepper, uh, Oscar the Orange, you mentioned, and Kate the Carrot. And I thought, how are they getting away with this? They're not selling the vegetable or fruit in Mm. question with this (laughs) toy set. (laughs) They're working in conjunction with Big Vegetable. Yeah. I mean, you can stick it on anything. You can call it Kerry Caviar. Doesn't matter. (laughs) For every price level. Well, this speaks to the fact that eventually, of course the original idea of sticking the pieces into actual potatoes did turn into the modern incarnation of Mr. Potato Head that we know and love today. And that came about, I have to say, I feel like the US government invented Mr. Potato Head more than anything else (laughs) because it was new regulations in the early 60s, surprisingly not around dragging around rotten veg as a toy, but about the pushpins. The pushpins were too sharp. They now had to be Mm. duller to comply with new federal safety regulations. Now they were too dull to pierce a potato effectively. Government ruining everyone's fun. I yeah. know. Hasbro <laughs> then had to pivot to the plastic potato head, which was still roughly the size of a jacket potato. It would get its larger size in 1975. Again, thank you, US government. There were new regulations about small toy parts. So mm. they had to double the size of the model, and that brought about the, you know, the famous recognizable Mr. Potato Head. The I think the I think iconic Mr. Potato Head, let's be honest. Yeah. The classic Mr. Potato Head. I, I've got to come clean, guys. Until I started researching this, I had no idea that Mr. Potato Head predated Toy Story. No. no. There, I'll wow. tell you. Wow. Because, what? and I did see Mr. Potato Heads, but keep in mind, Toy Story came out when I was four. Yeah. So all Potato mm. Heads I saw were post me having seen Toy Story, and I did, just assumed. Rebecca, <laughs> I just imagine you having thought that there were just no toys until Toy Story came out, <laughs> because that's when your consciousness started. Okay, it invented Woody, it invented Buzz Lightyear. Why would I not think Fair. it invented Mr. Mm. Potato Head? And you know what? Don Rickles gave that Potato Head personality because. I realise yeah. now, having researched it, that Mr. Potato had had no noticeable traits beyond yes. his interchangeable facial expressions. They did try in the late 90s to do a TV show of Mr. Potato Head, the Mr. Potato Head show, which was kind of an attempt to do like a Larry Sanders show for children. Amazing. Because it's about Mr. Potato that. Head. I would totally watch it. Yeah, Mr. Potato <laughs> Head. Now you've and said his... that though, I would want Gary Shandling voicing Mr. Potato yeah, Head, if she wasn't the case. <laughs> well, so in it, Mr. Potato Head and his friends, it's, all, it's a puppet show, they're all puppets. Yeah. All his friends are various items of food. They are putting on a TV show. It's kind of a metaphorical thing. I think, if anything, they tried too hard. Mm. But the episode one, I'll just read you the episode one synopsis, which I think hints at the difficulty of creating organic storylines for an anthropomorphic potato <laughs> baloney one of the friends attempts to deliver a vhs tape containing mr potato head's cop episode to the tv guys when suddenly a pair of aliens arrive on earth seeking a new ruler for their interstellar empire meanwhile mm. dr fruitcake creates the ham monster for mr potato head's monster episode which proves dangerous for him to control I no just, you've already gone wrong it you've thrown to be everything a, in there yeah it needed to be kitchen sink what mr and mr <laughs> potato head get up to in the privacy of their own mr head. potato head exactly. by john osborne that's what arian's here for well, the fact that they were so innovative makes it all the more surprising to me that it wasn't until 2006 that hasbro started selling themed kits mm. stuff like mm. pirate and firefighter mr potato head and then franchise tie-ins I can't believe it was as late as 2006 but they started bringing in sets for see if you can guess the franchises Star that Wars, these are linked to mm, yeah. Harry Potter <laughs> Well, let me just. Well, let me Toy Story. The names. Let me do justice to them <laughs> for goodness' sake. <laughs> yeah. Darth Tater. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, good, yeah. Nice, yeah. Luke Frywalker. Do we like that one? Yeah, I do. That's, well, that's I mean, pushing it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, there's like a Transformers you know. themed one. Optimash uh-huh. Prime. <laughs> yes. And <laughs> my absolute favourite, and this is for the Iron Man franchise, Tony Starch. Ah, oh, love it. <laughs> that's a bit too clever. Again, that's for the people who like the Larry Sanders uh, TV show. Now, this episode first aired last year exclusively to members of Club Retrospectors. Join today and unlock a new episode this Sunday. Patreon.com/slash Retrospectors. <laughs>